Absolutely. So um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for the invitation to speak today. Uh, the topic that I'm going to talk about is structural heart disease and evolution in imaging and interventions. And my focus, and I know you, you had another talk on structural heart uh, a couple of weeks ago, focusing on transcatheter aortic valve replacement and aortic valve therapies. I'll focus a little bit more on imaging and other uh, valve uh, issues that happen in the heart and how we can handle this uh, via catheter-based intervention. So I'm Associate Professor of uh, Cardiology at Hofstra School of Medicine and the Director here at Northwell Health of our uh, Structural Heart Program. So if you think about what we do in, in cardiology and interventional cardiology, there's been a paradigm shift as to the different uh, things that we can do on the heart. And, the, and in our field, we've really divided into three different arenas. Coronary interventions, where we fix the coronary arteries and we, we apply stents uh, to treat heart attacks. We do endovascular therapies for peripheral vascular disease, so all the blood vessels that are outside the heart. And this can include uh, the carotid arteries, the arteries that supply blood to the brain for strokes, uh, and the vessels that supply blood to the, the legs uh, that can typically cause uh, leg playing and claudication. And more recently, this field of structural heart disease, which is really the non-coronary interventions that occur that we can fix of the heart. So what is structural heart disease? Well, it's an application of catheter-based techniques to treat extravascular cardiac and adult congenital problems. So there's really three things and, and three different areas that it sort of encompasses. It encompasses adult congenital heart disease. So congenital heart defects, defects of the heart that, uh, that uh, patients are born with, valvular heart disease, so the, the four types of valves in the heart, problems with these four valves uh, are what we can treat, and other, uh, uh, other heart issues. Just to note that re this really fulfills an unmet need in our field. Uh, it spans disciplines, so there's a lot of specialties that are involved many of which you've heard of in this lecture series. It requires advanced imaging, and I'll talk about a lot of the different advanced imaging topics. And the therapies that we provide here are less invasive non-surgical strategies to treat our patients. And it encompasses cardiac surgeons, interventional cardiologists, or structural heart cardiologists like myself, uh, and the pediatric cardiologists. So a lot has happened over the last 50 years in this space. Uh, we've uh, gone from very simple diagnostic therapies to really understand what's going on in the heart to much more complicated therapies to fix these diagnostic problems. And it's really a collaboration, as I said, between specialties, advanced imaging techniques, and these new device technologies from a multitude of companies that really allow us to achieve success uh, with a lot of patients. Now, I just really reemphasize that it's not just one person doing a procedure on a patient. It's really a full heart team approach and a collaborative model that allows us to really treat the patient in, its to in, in his or her totality. So what is uh, imaging? Imaging is everything. And this just gives you an understanding as to what we can see on the heart through less invasive imaging. You can see on the left, this is a 3D ultrasound and you can make out valve structures, catheters, wires, on the second is a 4D CTA. You can actually do a CAT scan and in a multi-phase CAT scan actually see the heart beating with really extremely good resolution and definition. And here you can actually see the, this is the aorta here, uh, the left atrium. You can see the mitral valve and the calcium on the mitral valve. In addition to the aortic valve, which you can see on, on top, in this location, this patient has severe calcific aortic stenosis. And you can see that trileaflet valve right here. Do 4D MRI with flow, and you can see the color, and this patient has significant aortic regurgitation, so a leaky aortic valve, to therapies by what we call ICE, intracardiac echo. By putting a probe inside the heart, you can actually image the heart and allow us to introduce uh, different device technologies within the heart. But imaging just doesn't do diagnostic, uh, uh, doesn't provide us diagnostic utility, but also help, helps us navigate our equipment to provide procedural success. What can we do with imaging? This is just one example where we can do a full reconstructed image of the heart and do what we call a fly-through. Actually go from the chest wall directly into the heart cavity 
to understand the complexities of the patient's anatomy and actually to uh, reintroduce uh, technical or te technological devices to understand how our approaches can interact uh, with patient structures. And you can see going in through the apex of the heart, we can make out the papillary muscles uh, and the valvular structure for the mitral valve, as you can see right here. Blue being calcium, and we don't want to interact with calcium with device technologies in the heart. So what do we do for imaging? Well, we send the patient to, uh, to get an imaging test. We process this imaging. We discuss our approach. And then we bring this imaging technology into the catheterization laboratory. And this is just one example of what we would do 10 years ago to put an x-ray technology or fluoroscopy next to our CAT scan to help uh, plan an intervention. So where we were forced as interventionalists to actually merge the technology in our heads uh, to, to plan what we do. And this is what we would need, seeing two imaging modalities side by side we would merge the x-ray and the CAT scan that we, we got pre-procedure in our heads while we're doing uh, procedures to, to gain access in the heart. And this is just one example where we're taking a needle to poke from the right to left side of the heart uh, to perform uh, uh, an intervention to plug a hole, in this case, around a mechanical mitral valve. What are we capable of doing now? Well, there are many, many options to do what's called fusion imaging. We see it now in our day-to-day -day practice in the military, in the weather forecast, and even other medical specialties where we're, over, we're able to overlay one imaging modality onto another, creating a sort of augmented reality. What we're capable of doing within the catheterization laboratory is taking this pre-procedural CAT scan, merging with our x-ray for fusion imaging, and taking our live echocardiographic image and doing the same thing, merging it with our x-ray for additional fusion imaging to help us perform procedures. What does this advanced technology look like? And just to go through it in, in brief summary, we're able to take that pre-procedural CAT scan, segment the different chambers of the heart, in this case, valves, you can see a mechanical aortic and mitral valve, but we could segment out the aorta, the coronary arteries, the left atrium in green, the left ventricle in red, and plan out a procedure. We can place landmarks on the heart, as you can see here, and this is to gain access to the left atrium as we see here. We can go from the right atrium by poking a needle through the heart but we can actually place landmarks to identify where we need to go inside the heart and use that to help guide us during an intervention. We can place virtual valves. This is just one example where we're able to take a transcatheter valve, appropriately size it with a model, place it within the heart, change the size and the depth to guide what we wanna do during a procedure. And this is just one example of that hole around the valve that we're capable, in this case, of landmarking the chest wall to the heart, a direct line of access, what we call transapical access. We've planned out this line of intervention and then overlaying our image directly onto fluoroscopy or x-ray, we're able to stick from the skin with a needle directly into the heart without having to cut the skin. So showing how very important our imaging tools are to gain access into the heart and to fix problems in the heart uh, without having to do an open surgical procedure. We can do this with ultrasound, not just with CAT scan. So overlaying the whole ultrasound image onto our x-ray to see what we're doing in real time with live imaging. Pretty soon, within the next couple of years, we'll, able, we'll be able to take our pre-procedural imaging, as you can see here, create a biospecific mechanical model, in this case of the mitral valve, do computational flow analysis, and then plan a therapy before we enter the room to determine what our best options are before or for our patients, to get a real predicted outcome with a lot of these technologies that we're attempting to plan and perform.
this is the future and we look forward to this. So what are some of the therapies that we're capable of providing? Well, this is a whole list of different transcatheter therapies that we can provide in structural heart. I'll talk about a few of these, but this list is quite vast. So these are some of the important interventions that we perform in structural heart disease. You've already spoken about TAVR, transcatheter aortic valve replacement. I'll talk a little bit about how, how we can fix surgical valves that fail, what we call valve and valve procedures. We'll talk about catheter procedures on the mitral valve, both repair and how we can replace them without having to do open heart surgery. And uh, lastly, left atrial appendage closure for patients who have stroke related to irregular rhythms like atrial fibrillation, we can plug a sac in the upper chamber of the heart, close the sac off and reduce a patient's risk of stroke without having to put them on blood thinners. So one example, this is an 80 year old patient who had prior cardiac surgery for bypass. His heart function is diminished. He's got a very weak heart, had an aortic valve replaced over 15 years ago, and presents with refractory heart failure symptoms on blood pressure uh, stimulating medications. We know that this biological valve has failed and his operative risk to undergo open heart surgery is very high. His risk of mortality is over 20%. Most surgeons find this to risk to be prohibitive. This is what the valve looks like on, on CAT scan. You can see thickening of the leaflets of the biological valve and typically these biological valves will last 10 to 15 years, but when they fail, in the past, the only option has been open heart surgery. Now we have the capability of putting one of these catheter valves inside and creating essentially a new biological valve. So what are the options instead of open heart surgery? Well, percutaneous valve and valve implantation. Well, what, what, what is the theory behind this? Well, you have the surgical prosthesis here with the sewing ring. You have the leaflets of the biological valve here. But if these have failed, if you put a TAVR valve, a transcatheter valve inside, the stent pushes the leaflets of the old valve aside and inside that stent frame are normal functioning leaflets of a valve. And this is an FDA approved technique, something that we commonly do now. Well, we've already seen the imaging technologies so you can segment out the left ventricle, you can see the sewing ring of the surgical valve. This patient has wires for a pacemaker. We can virtually plan out the procedure. So choose a valve to go inside this surgical valve. Once we're happy with the planning of the procedure, we can overlay that imaging technology directly onto our x-ray image and then place that catheter valve right into the sewing ring of that prior surgical valve. Effectively replacing the valve, giving the patient a new lease on life. And you can see as we're unsheathing this valve, this valve expands. This is a self-expandable valve, a Medtronic core valve. And inside this large stent frame are the leaflets of the outer lining of a, cat, of a pig, a porcine pericardial valve that will replace this patient's valve. And you can see the stent frame here. And on CT scan, you can see how nicely it fits within the surgical valve of this patient. So now this patient doesn't have to undergo open heart procedure and is back to his normal quality of life. What we do in the aortic position, we can also do in the mitral position. So this valve fails, this mitral prosthesis. We can create the same planning tools, virtually choose what valve that we want, and directly go into the heart without having to cut the patient. And as you can see here, put a balloon expandable valve within the mitral valve, effectively replacing this patient's mitral prosthesis. So giving this patient a new lease on life. 
What are some of the other things that we can do that are fun with valves? Well, sometimes the valves are too small. And in order to help expand them, we can do what's called a valve fracture. We can put a high pressure balloon, fracture the sewing ring of the valve that, it, that we put into to allow it, the valves to expand a little bit better, to give a little more opening, to allow the transcatheter valve to work better. Here's another case, a 60 year old female with, with coronary artery disease. She has a history of stents placed in the arteries, her ejection fraction, her pump, her heart muscle is strong. She has lung disease and has a leakiness of the mitral valve. So now we're shifting uh, topics from aortic valve therapy to focus on native mitral valve. So in this case, this patient's risk of surgery is about 15% risk of mortality from an open heart procedure to fix this valve. Is there an alternative? And there is alternatives now to, to fix mitral valves. And just to give you an example on ultrasound, what does a leaky mitral valve look like? Well, the mitral valve can, is here between the left ventricle and the left atrium. The purpose of a valve is to close to prevent uh, leakiness or retrograde flow of blood from the left ventricle, the main pumping chamber, chamber to the left atrium. And this blue color, as we see here, is severe mitral regurgitation. Blood's not effectively getting out of the heart. You can see the mitral valve on the CAT scan on the right-hand side of the screen nicely with good resolution. And what's our alternative for therapy? Well, now we have the ability to put what's called a mitral clip, a technique used by surgeons, uh, which typically in the past has been a suture to plicate the mitral valve creating this double orifice. And what this does, it brings the leaflets together, improving and reducing leakiness of the valve, allowing this patient to have a better quality of life, reducing the regurgitation. Well, this leaflet plication, uh, putting a, a clip at the A2, so the center of the mitral valve, the A2P2 region, uh, using a steerable device that we place inside the heart. How, does it, uh, how is it applied? Well, we go into the femoral vein in the leg, go up to the heart, cross over inside the heart, as you can see here on x-ray. And once we gain access into the left atrium and that upper chamber of the heart, you can see here the color, the leakiness of the valve by that red color, we can cross over inside the heart and advance this clip technology to the mitral valve it has gripper arms, as you can see here on the right, excuse me, upper left-hand side of the screen, that grab the anterior and posterior leaflets. Once the grab occurs, the, the, the clip is closed, brings the leaflets together at the, at the site of the majority of the leak, reducing regurgitation or leakiness of the valve. In addition, there are other technologies that we can apply therapy. This is a tendine technology, a transcatheter mitral valve replacement, as you can see here. And this is just a cartoon to show that we're capable now, not just of repairing the mitral valve, but of actually replacing it. So this is in trial, not FDA approved yet, but a FDA uh, trial that we're participating in, where we're capable of making a small incision through the chest wall. So this is a hybrid approach going into the left ventricle with a large sheath and deploying a transcatheter mitral valve. This is the example of the tendine valve, as you can see here. It's made of two stent frames. The inner stent frame has, houses the valve. It's made of pericardial porcine leaflets, as you can see here. And this valve is deployed within the native valve with a tether that sits on the apex of the heart where we enter into the left ventricular cavity. This valve is retrievable, as if we do, do not like the position of the valve, we can retrieve it and take it out. With the apical pad that sits on the apex of the heart. What does this look like during ultrasonography on an echocardiogram? And you can see here, the valve within the native valve with the leaflets. When you do an injection of contrast within the left ventricle, 
Typically regurgitation would show contrast in the upper chamber of the heart. And here you see no contrast with a nice valve uh, and its skirts within the left atrium. So this patient went from severe mitral regurgitation to effectively having no leakiness of the valve by having this transcatheter valve implanted. And you can see nicely on a post-procedural CAT scan, placement of this new catheter-based valve uh, within the heart while the heart is contracting. And you can see here the apical pad. So new ways to replace the, the heart valve without having to do open heart surgery. In addition, there are other technologies. We we're one of the first ones to, to do the, the, another type of valve, the tiara valve. Instead of using that apical uh, tether that we, we used to see, this allows us to place via the same mechanism through a small incision with clips that will clip onto the mitral valve and lock it in place also with a stent, leaflets functioning inside to effectively replace the valve. So a multitude of different technologies that are now in our toolbox uh, in, at a trial level that hopefully over the next couple of year, years uh, will be refined, will be able to apply to a multitude of patients. And hopefully some of you will be able to apply this technology uh, to your patients um, when, uh, when you go through your training. And finally, a case of a left atrial appendage closure. So this is a case of a 71-year-old female with heart failure, had a prior stroke, has a high risk of stroke in the recurrent year, uh, roughly 10 to 12% risk of annualized stroke. She has bleeding. Her risk of bleeding is about 9%. And the question is for patients who've had prior strokes with atrial fibrillation, who are high risk for bleeding, giving blood thinners becomes a problem, can we offer an alternative strategy? And we do have alternatives within the field of structural heart to plug the upper chamber of the heart, a sac that accounts for 90% of the thrombus associated with atrial fibrillation causing stroke. This is what that atrial uh, appendage looks like on CAT scan, on pathology, and clot during atrial fibrillation forms because the atrium doesn't contract very well. And as I mentioned, 90% of the thrombus originates in this upper sac. What does thrombus in transit look like? Well, clot forms in that appendage, jumps out, and goes to the brain. And this is what happens. That clot pumps out of the heart, goes to the brain, and now we're left with dealing with a life-altering event for our patients. So how can we reduce this if we can't give blood thinners to our patients? Well, there are technologies now, as I show here, the Watchman device. There are technologies that will come about in the future that will plug this sac, this upper chamber of the heart, effectively occluding it. This will grow into the heart, reducing a patient's risk of stroke. What does this therapy look like? Well, you can see the left atrial appendage here. We do our measurements in our virtual uh, uh, placement of technologies to understand what is optimal for the patient. We can do our fusion imaging technologies and then plan out our approach where we go under sedation, we poke between the right and left chambers of the upper chambers of the heart, gain access to that left atrium and left atrial appendage as you can see here, uh, and a multitude of plugs or devices that can seal off this upper chamber sac that will reduce a patient's risk of stroke without having to give blood thinners. What does this device technology look like on post-procedural CAT scan? And you can see here with that plug in place, it gives a surface where blood cannot pull, clot cannot form, effectively reducing a patient's risk of stroke. So to summarize, the field of structural heart disease has evolved significantly through the years. Parallel with the growth of multimodality imaging, you've seen a lot of our 
echo, CT, and MRI technologies. It's more than just TAVR, transcatheter aortic valve replacements. There are a growing host of interventions that can provide less invasive alternatives to our patients who are deemed too high risk or not good candidates for surgery. And all of our interventions require a multidisciplinary team approach to the care of the complex patient. It's important to note that this team approach really does change the game for the quality and level of care we're able to provide for our patients. To, to conclude, uh, don't forget to call it a procedure. It makes it less scary for the patient. So all the stuff that we do are procedures on the heart, but know that we do this in collaboration with our surgical colleagues, with our imaging colleagues, uh, to really provide the best care for our patients. So with that, I'll conclude uh, and I'll open it up to questions. Thank you very much. All right, I'm gonna open up the chat now. If you wanna stop screen sharing and take a look at the chat. Great. So those yeah. questions will probably come in in a second. Okay. What are some of my hobbies, uh, extracurricular activities that I partake in? That's a great question. So I think, I think um, is that an old question? I think you're looking at old questions. All right, so tell me, uh, where do I start? Start at 11.30. Oh, yeah, 11.30. So what challenges do you face when doing your job? Tell me where, I should, you tell me. Yeah, right where it starts is what challenges do you face when you're, that's where they started for you. Uh, so, I mean, I think with any field, with any um, job, there's a lot of challenges. I think, um, you know, once you get to a level, uh, as you'll realize with medicine, uh, this has required a lot of training to get to this point. Um, in the current job with structural heart disease, um, you'll realize that the patients are complicated. Uh, patients themselves are challenging in terms of anatomy. Um, for this requires a multidisciplinary integration. So it, it requires pulling together multiple fields and multiple teams to come up with strategic plans to care for the patient. So I think the challenges that, that we face become actually um, uh, positives because once we overcome and figure out these problems, we come up with really good game plans to care for patients. So I think the challenges with integrating uh, our, you know, our teams together, um, looking at imaging, look, uh, discussing cases with the surgeons, uh, pulling this into the laboratory to, to come up with solid plans for patient care. Uh, in the end, the challenges become the success because once we develop a good care plan, we really, uh, um, really are able to do something special for our patients. All right, um, geez, there are a lot of questions. Um, you, do, you mentioned the 1019 VR implantation as a new technology. How does the valve stay in place when implanted? What are the risks of displacements of the artificial valve? So great questions. There are these new technologies have multiple ways of staying in place. Um, typically oversizing in the annulus in the valve. So we oversize about 20% uh, of the size. So oversizing within the, the native annulus helps us. Uh, there, are, there are clips, so locking mechanisms that will uh, keep the valve in place. You saw the apical tether with the tendine. That helps us, uh, helps this valve stay in place. So there's multiple uh, different mechanisms that keep the, keeps these valves in place. Um, how are prosthetic valves fixed in the heart? I touched on that. I like the drawing. Someone, the actually, wants to, uh, someone oh, yeah. actually wants to know your hobbies and extracurriculars. They asked if they want to, they said it's refreshing to see physicians as humans as well. Yeah, so I, I think it's important to stay balanced. So even though this really does take a lot of our time and dedication, um, extracurricular activities I think are important. Uh, for me, um, cooking, I, uh, I cook a lot. Uh, I play uh, the piano, I'm learning guitar right now. Um, you know, balancing it with family, so spending time with the family is key. Um, there's a lot of uh, things that, uh, between playing sports, I'm now a huge fan of yoga. So if many, any of you guys do yoga, I think it's, uh, uh, a great thing, particularly through this whole crisis of uh, COVID. Uh, so I think uh, staying balanced is key and extracurricular activities are important. What else? You can help me sort of 
manage through this because there are a ton of ton of uh, yeah, just, questions. Yeah, just do what you can. There are a lot of you know there are a thousand people here, so just get to whatever. Yeah. Place. So uh, Larry, a procedure, a, a very astute question. I sort of snuck that in, but that's a very high level uh, left atrial appendage closure question. That typically is not done. It's been black boxed by the FDA. I've done a number of these procedures. The lariat is a suture mediated technique. So you actually take a lasso and suture and put it over the left atrial appendage from the pericardial space. So you get around the heart, not inside, put a suture to cinch it. Um, it's a technique that's not FDA approved um, as a therapy that we could provide, um, but there's been a lot of risks so most people are not using that uh, currently. Um, why did I choose this path in medicine? It's funny because personally, uh, my, I went into medicine to do ophthalmology. My first medicine rotation as a third year med student, um, I saw someone get very sick and um, realized on the ophthalmology service that I wasn't able to take care of the full patient. Uh, my next rotation happened to be cardiology and after thinking about what I'd like to do in a hands-on approach, I saw a catheterization, and from seeing that catheterization, um, really stuck with me and really shaped my entire career. Um, now, back then, structural heart wasn't a field, um, and it, when I got into interventional cardiology, um, I got at the very early stages of structural heart, and that's, you know, my interest grew in this space uh, from that. So, You'll, you'll realize that you'll choose a path and a direction, but you know, there's gonna be motions and, and directions that will sort of further direct you in a different direction, but ultimately achieving and satisfying the goals that you wanna achieve in your field. So you know, I've always wanted a, a, a therapeutic uh, field, something that I can actually uh, do a procedure or intervention on a patient, something use, using my hands that would that would effectively change a patient's life. And then I can treat, uh, I can treat the patient as a whole. Um, going through the list, uh, what are your thoughts on safety of drug coating balloons in the, in the SFA? Uh, you know, I think there's, there's clearly a role uh, for this therapy. Um, you know, we put drugs on stents. It helps with uh, restenosis, putting uh, drugs on balloons. You know, even uh, there has to be some value with this therapy, how we deliver the, the drug and how this drug stays eluded in the location becomes an issue. But I think, uh, I think there's, there's value in this uh, potential option. Uh, and I think there's, you know, this is gonna, it's, it's gonna prove to be a, a utility in multiple spaces within the vasculature moving down the road. How does mitroclip inhibit blood flow? Well, what you're doing is, you're, you're bringing the leaflets together at the, at the site of most leak to help the valve oppose to reduce regurgitation. So you're plicating and bringing those leaflets together in a position where most of the leak is occurring. Um, you know, this was a surgical technique that uh, called the Alfieri stitch that was used for many, many years that showed efficacy. And now with MitroClip over the last, uh, uh, six, seven years has actually, and honestly, it was even started 10 years ago, but since it's FDA approved back in 16, really is showing uh, good benefit. Um, how long can those new mitral valves last within the heart? Uh, we're, we're learning. Um, you know, right now, we're just starting to implant the valves. You know, our first uh, IDE FDA approved trial is ongoing. Our longest patient is now uh, is now about 18 months, um, but we're, you know, we're learning in this space how long these mitral valves last. Is there a video of how the Lariat procedure is performed? Uh, sure, you can email me offline. I can send you a video, no problem. All this imaging uh, is available at most hospitals or for research. Well, most of this is available at most hospitals. I will say the 4D MRIs is more of a research tool um, 4D CT requires some post-processing software. Intracardiac echo is available everywhere. So the majority of these technologies are available at most hospitals. Um, and it just requires sometimes the post-processing requires a little bit more time. How do I work along pe alongside pediatric and adult uh, cardiologists for congenital heart defect? 
HPFX and how has this field evolved over the years? Well, I would say structural heart has really evolved from the pediatric uh, congenital cardiologists, a lot of the techniques. And, um, you know, we're, we have to realize that uh, in any field, but in particular in, in, in medicine and in, in heart and cardiology and heart therapies, that one person can't provide the best therapy. It's multiple people working together. So, you know, team approaches are the best, even in the laboratory. Um, and, and this field has evolved significantly over the years. What is the specific step that prevents blood clots from forming in left atrial appendage closure? So if you close off this sac, so when the heart contracts and the atrium contract, it typically contracts atrium and ventricle, that love dub. When atrial fibrillation occurs, the heart's sort of quivering. And in that sac, if the, that sac is quivering, blood pools, clot can pool in this form sac because it's not going anywhere. As if you make a cut on yourself and blood sits on your skin, it provides a, an environment for clot formation. And if this clot moves, it can go the first blood vessels off the heart of the brain. So that's how you get clot. And if you can seal it, 90% of the clot forms in the sac and you can help the patient by closing uh, closing the atrial appendage. What does my routine work look like? Um, it, it can vary. I get up very early. I round on my patients uh, between 6.15 uh, and 6.45. I sit for rounds from 6.45 to 7.30. Um, after 7.30, it depends on the day. Sometimes I see patients in the office. I do procedures three days a week, so today, you happen to be catching me in the midst of uh, a procedure day. So we're, we're about to do a TAVR on a very sick patient. Um, and uh, we, we work through the day taking care of patients. Uh, and usually leave the hospital between uh, six, seven o'clock at night. So does mitral clip decrease flow out of the mitral valve into the left ventricle during normal flow? So, if you reduce the amount of blood going backwards to the upper chamber of the heart, you effectively get blood out of the heart. So if you're getting blood out of the heart, patients are seeing this to their brain, to their organs, and effectively are not backing up of blood to the lungs. They're not getting shorter breath, and they're able to do exercise and more activity. How difficult is it to balance your professional and personal life? I think um, as you'll realize as you get older, there, there are challenges in, in doing this, um, but you know, setting goals, uh, both work and, and personal goals and organizing your life, I think are the best options um, you know, for, a, for a healthy lifestyle. So you know, even though there are challenges, you have to set goals and priorities and uh, you'll be able to successfully um, achieve your goals to make the right work-life balance for you. What is the most impressive medical related extracurricular for pre-med med students? Uh, great question. Um, interesting. So one of the things, that's a tough topic, but one of the things that uh, there, I believe it's, it's the head of the surgical program at Penn, um, he, this individual does not take people into their fellowship unless they're a part of a sports team. Now, sports during college, and, and, and you guys are all high school students, if I'm not mistaken, um, sports, sports provide a, a different level of you know, teamwork, provides an understanding as you know, um, you know, how you work with others, how you can uh, achieve similar goals. And you know, this faculty for picking a trainee will, will want, want a, a, someone who's participating in a, a collegiate level sports. I'm not uh, advocating it, but it's an interesting idea because if you think about medicine, it also becomes a team sport. So I think any skill that can improve your skill set for the field that you want as you sort of build on it is what you want to achieve, whatever that um, extracurricular activity may be, sports just being one of them. What treatments are available for calcification? Unfortunately, there are no um, medical therapies for this. Um, so we have to 
um, you know, in cases of valves or presence of calcium in the heart, there are only ways to modify calcium and to exclude it. As medicine is a long-term commitment, did you ever feel why did I choose medicine and not some other profession? And if you did, how did you overcome it? Well, you know, I think you realize it's, you know, your medicine is, a, is an in it to win it sort of game. Uh, and it's definitely delayed gratification. Um, you know, you set short-term goals, but the long-term goal is where you achieve in medicine. And it's a very long path. Um, it's really staying focused on your overall game plan. But I think re-evaluating re, re your goals and agenda have become uh, extremely important because ultimately your overall happiness becomes the most important. Most common causes of MS, mitral stenosis, and MR, mitral regurgitation, is rheumatic heart disease. How can we reduce this risk? Well, the most common is rheumatic fever as, as you know, outside the United States. Um, worldwide, but in the U.S., it's it's not um, most common cause of mitral regurgitation in the in the United States. Um, it really re is um, functional, uh, which occurs from a reduced heart function and stress on the valve. Um, degenerative, which is um, a, brow, a valve degenerating or breaking, um, are other important causes. Um, but there are a whole host. Mitral stenosis, common cause, rheumatic. Uh, we see it uh, rarely in the United States because we have therapies for rheumatic fever, um, but uh, degeneration has also, where calcium builds up on the valve, has been a common cause as you age. What For percutaneous left atrial appendage closure, um, what are the long-term effects of having the part of the heart closed permanently? Well, we do this during surgery and, you know, the, 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 it's a, it's a, what we call a vestigial appendage. It's like the appendix. Um, you can take it out and it has no issue. Um, so there's really no, we think no long-term effects. There are um, hormones that are secreted from this tissue in the appendage, but overall, we, you know, we don't think there's any uh, significant effects. What did your career path training look like after college? Um, you know, it was a lot of, a lot of training. So college, it was med school for four years, um, was for me, I, I took uh, a year off for med school. I worked in finance before finalizing my decision to go to med school. Med school, um, uh, so med school four years, residency for three years. I did three years of cardiology training, uh, another year of interventional training, another year of structural training. So in total, 12 years of training after high school. So. For my field, a very long uh, road, but something that you know I'm capable of doing a lot of uh, very cool things to uh, fix the heart and to uh, uh, and to help help uh, people. Do you have any advice for a high school student which is uh, wishing to pursue career in cardiology? Um, I think it's um, you know setting that path for yourself um, that makes you achieve that. So. Um, each stage requires, uh, requires uh, achieving a certain goal, um, and uh, once you achieve each of the small goals, uh, ultimately you'll win the big goal. And, you know, that path may change. As you see, you, know, you saw for myself, you know, I you know, w went into medicine and, and was choosing ophthalmology, being an eye doctor, and within, you know, a short period of time, that path changed. Um, but, you know, the ultimate goal my final goals were ultimately achieved and you know i'm constantly setting new goals for myself you do yoga too uh, i i congrats to all people who do yoga i think it's a an important uh breathing i, I actually am trying to get some of my patients involved in it i think it's a great breathing tool um and um you know also ties in with meditation uh, Pilates, I've never tried before, but I'll keep that in mind. Um, thank you. Adrian, uh, is that a YouTube? I think I've actually done uh, yoga by Adrian on YouTube uh, for breathing exercises. So I, I, uh, I advocate for this. I'm, I'm, I'm on your side. You can uh, definitely email questions. Oh my gosh, there are a lot of questions. 
how has coronavirus uh, affected my work? So we practice in New York City. Um, it shut down our, um, our patient volume, elective cases for a number of months. We only did emergencies, um, but you know, New York is back up and running and uh, we're, we're doing uh, actually an increase in volume now uh, to make up for um, our, our lost time. Do you see any permanent changes in our, in our work? Absolutely, we're doing a lot of telemedicine and telehealth. Um, I think it's a great thing for patients because a lot of the therapies and changes in therapies we can be performed at least in medicines as an outpatient and via just video chat. So I think this is being worked into our armamentarium. I think it's great. What are some of the emerging fields in medicine? Well, I'm so focused on cardiology. I know it's happening in my space, but you know, cardiology and cardiac surgery are changing ever so fastly. Um, but robotics is in this, uh, uh, implementing uh, machine learning and uh, AI is becoming a huge thing in how, how, how we practice. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see this as a, as a huge game changer in our field. What is the lifespan of these mitral valves? We don't know yet. Aortic valves, we have data on five to seven, uh, five data, great data, seven to nine years, good data. But we should have 10 year data on the aortic valves within another year. Um, and the mitral valves, we'll, we'll see. Um, our hope is that they last as long as the aortic valves, um, but we have a yet, uh, yet to learn in this space. I'll send out my email. It's my first name, my first initial C, Klieger, K-L-I-G-E-R at Northwell, uh, myhospital.edu, and we can send an email to everyone. Yeah. When you pierce the heart, there must be a, a bruise doesn't that affect the electrical signal inside the heart uh, and doesn't conduct? So where we puncture the interatrial septum separating the upper chambers of the heart, there's no conduction tissue. It's just a piece of tissue separating the chambers. We can easily, under imaging guidance, puncture, put uh, catheters across without any effect on the heart. Would you describe your jobs as stressful? Um, yeah, there's a level of stress. I think it, you know, the, the level of, of planning and methodical uh, um, implementation of plans um, really help to reduce that stress level. And it's really the discussions with the patients um, that you know, everyone's aware, we're constantly communicating. So team's aware of communicating, patient's aware of communicating your risks. And you know, we're doing high level um, complex stuff on the heart, but we're able to do it in a way that, that everyone's on the same page and we choose, uh, we, we, we choose the same, we achieve the same goal. Was I able to keep up with my instruments in med school and residency? Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, sometimes you get sidetracked, but I think you can uh, uh, balance uh, in any, every direction. Uh, you guys are in, so I guess it's a mix of high school and college. Um, uh, some athletes here. So I think it's a, um, you know, you can do a lot of different um, uh, things. And I think uh, definitely sports are great. So you just have to keep up with your academics. How dangerous is this, uh, ischemia? Ischemia is, you know, if you can't get blood flow to the heart, it means myocardium. Heart muscle dies, it doesn't degenerate. Um, it's a problem. So that's why we have therapies to reduce and improve blood flow to all territories of the heart. Would tennis be a team sport? I'm a tennis player, so uh, I would definitely say tennis is a team sport. Um, so kudos to tennis. Med student audience, I think it's high, high school med, to med student audience. Well, if you're already in med school, uh, you already, you, you're, already, you're already partly there. Are there treatments for reducing plaques and preventing heart attacks? There's a whole field of preventative cardiology now with a lot of great drug therapies. I think it's key to understand that, that you know, what we do to ourselves, smoking, uh, diet, lack of exercise has a huge impact and we have a, uh, that's probably the biggest preventative measure, but there are therapies uh, that, are, that, are, that are medical related that can be applied. Calcification, we don't know how uh, people develop it. Is it part genetic, uh, part environmental? We're still learning in this space. What are so, some of my short-term and long-term goals? Oh, geez, if I, if I only had the time to get into this. But, uh, you know, it varies, I, and, and I do split it up because I, I do think, you know, um, 
work-related goals, home-related goals, um, in and outside of the office are, are very important. Um, and, you know, I divide my work week uh, into achieving goals that will satisfy all of these. Um, to give an example for work-related goals, um, you know, for us, we're trying to achieve certain metrics um, on um, providing high-level quality care for some of our procedures. So we're looking at some of these lag measures and providing uh, things that don't change that we're given reports on with developing what we call lead measures where we're, we're, we're achieving some game plans to effectively alter the quality metrics. And then we're, we're implementing those lead measures to hopefully affect the lag, the lag measures as we, as we move forward. Are most of my patients elderly? A majority are, but I will say we do adult congenital patients. You know, I'm an adult cardiologist, so I only treat patients over the age of 18. Um, but, you know, we treat a whole host of patients. Yoga with, <laughs> with Adrian uh, is great. And uh, uh, definitely, I've done, her, I've done it before, and she uh, has a huge following. How do I keep up with the latest technologies? I read a lot, and uh, I talk at lectures and, and do a lot of... Uh, uh, education outside. What are some of the new technologies implemented in my own practice? Well, augmented reality with all of the imaging you saw, um, but we're, we're, we're teetering with some of the new imaging technologies, uh, machine learning and how to implement that. Uh, those are the, in all the device technologies. So imaging and device technologies we have our hands in, um, but you know, we're working with industry uh, to do all the other stuff. Um, Porcine valves are also um, bovine, so outer lining a pit of cow. Um, there are valves that actually are made of the jugular vein of a cow um, that we use for transcatheter valves. Um, my email is get rid of the dot, so it's cleager at northwell.edu. Um, da Vinci robots used for more surgical procedures, so that's for our, our minimally invasive cardiac surgeons. And how do I stay motivated? Well, it's my patience and the love of what I do that keeps me motivated every day uh, and the push to new technologies. What do you think about someone in their 30s pursuing medicine? Is that too late? Um, you, know, you know, I do think it's, it's important to understand, you know, your long-term goals. Um, medicine is a long path. It could be a shorter path depending on the field that you take. Um, I think you do what makes you happy. Um, if you know you choose, you know you you, you want. If, if there's a goal that you, you know will, the field satisfies a goal, um, and you have a pathway that will make you happy, I think you shoot for it. Um, I just think you have to be aware of the challenges that are in this space, and it is a long, you know, especially for the field that I went into, it was a long path. So make sure you do your research and and you know talk to people who are in the space to 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 make sure that those goals uh, fit fit what you want. Favorite dish to cook? I cook. I cook almost everything. Um, yeah, there's nothing that I I, I don't cook. Uh, something I just started doing recently, uh, which I had never done before, was cooking fresh pasta. And uh, now I will never eat um, packaged pasta ever. Uh, fresh pasta. And you're a cool. Have to, I, you're gonna have to send out some recipes for everyone. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, tons of questions. I think um, I have a patient on the table. So I think with that, uh, we'll definitely send out some recipes. Uh, thanks, thanks again for the, the invite. Hopefully this was uh, informative and uh, uh, somewhat, somewhat interesting. And uh, um, good luck to everyone. Yep, thank you so much for joining us. Just as a reminder to everybody as well, we have Tumor Talk tonight with Dr. D'Amico at 4 p.m. The information for that's in the Facebook group or check out the Lennox Hill Instagram. But thank you, Dr. Collier, for joining us today. And thank you, everybody, for coming. And remember, it's not a tumor. Take care, guys.